So, um, I'm Paula Cavada, and my name is Naomi Madison, and we both uh, work at the Department of Psychology at Aarhus University in uh, Denmark. And today we would like to share with you um, a new project that we have started, but in an old topic that we have been working for some years, that um, explores how parents are uh, trusting and distrusting the institutions now in times of Corona. Lead. Um, so, oops. How do, you How do I? I don't know. Oh, there. <laughs> so, the aim of this is, is a presentation is to explore the dynamics of trust and distrust between parents of small children and the educational and care institutions under critical situations, as it is specifically the reopening of uh, these institutions after a post pandemic lockdown. Well, we're still in pandemic, but, uh, but the lockdown started ceasing with opening uh, the educational uh, centers. Right, and I just want to briefly um, give you a, 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 a quick overview of the background, um, what the statistics are like in, in Denmark, um, and after that I'll, I'll quickly make a sort of brief uh, introduction to the theory that we're working with, the theory of trust, and then Paula after that will uh, present the, the, the empirical study. So in Denmark, we, we are highly institutionalized. 71.7% .7 of all uh, children in the age of zero to three uh, attend daycare and 97.5% of all children between the ages of three and five attend kindergarten. And they do so for an average of seven and a half hours a day. Uh, and in, the children start in school at the age of six to 16, there's 10 years of compulsory school. So it is a country with, which is highly institutionalized. Um, and this is the, the especially the preschool, um, this highly institutionalization of, of uh, the, the early education um, became a, a normal um, situation in the, in the 1960s when the, the women started uh, being more active on the, in the workforce. Uh, and that could be termed sort of defamilized, uh, that the family is defamilized. So the children are being moved out of the families and a lot of the responsibility for uh, early education, for early childcare is given uh, to the institutions. Then we can talk about, um, about the 1990s, but particularly in, um, from about 2000 onwards, there's been a move that you could call uh, uh, being refamilized, where there's been an increased focus on how um, the family is, uh, and these early years in the family are incredibly important for the child's uh, future life success. So how the child uh, achieves in school is uh, directly connected to, um, to, to the early years, um, particularly the years from, from zero to three and the support that the children get in the families there. So there is an increased focus uh, on, on risk in general in society, but I'll just throw all of these up because, um, oh, sorry. Can you get it back? <laughs> sorry. No. <laughs> um, oh, there. There. All right, there, yes. Um, there is in general an increased uh, focus on risk in society and we have like Beck's uh, uh, brilliant analysis uh, from the uh, 1980s where he analyzes the risk society. So there is an increased level of uncertainty uh, in society in general. And trust uh, and analysis of the sociological analysis of trust that we have a lot of today, um, they emerge in the 1980s as well um, parallel to this um, this, this sort of increased emergence of risk awareness. And uh, Giddens writes, trust presupposes awareness of circumstances of risk. So there is no need to trust unless there is a, a risk. Um, so these two, two concepts are, are deeply connected. And what we're seeing in particularly early education, that there is an increased focus on, um, on, on the risk connected with the early years. Uh, and this uh, focus is, is rooted in, in uh, developmental psychology and neuropsychology, which um, has shown that, that, that these early years are incredibly important. So um, a researcher like Peter Moss, he, he uses the term, the story of quality and high returns to sort of describe how, um, 
how early education is increasingly being uh, held accountable for in reducing the risk of the early years and, and making sure that the uh, children do well later on in life. So, so by using the term high returns, he's also situating it in a sort of an economic um, discourse claiming, showing that, that how there's a lot of policies about early education, which stresses that uh, this, this, this reducing the risk in early education is important for later uh, life success and thereby also important for a society's general um, economic well-being in the welfare state and so on. So what Peter Moss uh, argues is that this, this uh, focus on risk in early education results in an increased account accountability and auditing in the early educational settings. But we're seeing, and um, particularly the last 10 to 20 years, we're seeing that this increased accountability and auditing is moved over to the family as well. So Frank Ferretti, a British sociologist, uh, coins the term parental determinism where he argues, well, um, this, this focus on how the early years is incredibly important for a child's later life success has resulted in an idea that um, what the parents do now will determine how um, children succeed later on. So there's a lot of focus put on what parents are doing. And we've put in this, this quote from Faircloth, um, which says, it is clear that there is a broader uh, cultural logic around intensive parenting, which holds that parents are wholly responsible for their children's outcomes. So in the Danish context, um, there's put a lot of focus on, um, on the collaboration between the early education setting and the parents so that they together can reduce the risk um, that are connected with this early childhood and uh, thereby enhance the possibilities of um, positive life success for the children. So what is trust? We um, develop our concept of trust based on, on the Danish philosopher Lukestrup, who argues that uh, trust is completely central uh, to, the, uh, to our social lives and every relationship requires some level of trust. So we could use uh, Goffman's um, notion of civil inattention as, as an example. So, so just walking down the street requires a certain level of trust because when I walk by somebody on the street, I trust that he will not or she will not uh, harm me in any way, will not hit me or mug me or abuse me. So, um, so even, even these very simple everyday interactions require some level of trust because in every interaction we do have some sort of power over the other. And, and um, so walking uh, by someone on the street, we have the power to harm them or the power to leave them alone. So that would be like the most basic uh, level of, of power in, in, in a very simple interaction. But of course, as soon as it becomes um, the, uh, the move into the family or in early daycare institutions, then it's really clear that this power is, is really big and there is a, um, and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of risk connected to this power. Somebody can, can um, either live up to our expectations and live up to the trust that we're giving them or they can, um, in, a, in a very severe way, uh, disappoint our trust. So, uh, another aspect that we want to stress is um, Lutzstrup uh, argues that trust is it's, it's something basic, but it's also what he calls a spontaneous life expression. So it's not cognitive and it's not something that we can decide on. So it's, you, you could kind of um, it, say it's kind of like uh, being in love. We can't decide to be in love. It kind of comes to us and grips us, but we can open ourselves up to it and we can decide to act as though we're in love. But, but the actual um, phenomenon is something that, that, that grips us and that is out of our control. So we can't decide to trust somebody, but we can decide to act as though we trust somebody. Instead, when distrust arises, uh, then we start to make these rational calculations and we, we start to make this risk uh, awareness. We, we, we calculate whether um, the, uh, it's, it's worth taking this risk or not and, and we, we act upon that. So trust is, a, is 
a phenomenon that we don't really notice until it becomes um, eroded. And the risk is something that sort of stands out as the phenomenon that is uh, the most, um, uh, the, the, that is uh, drawing our attention. So, so basically, um, when we trust somebody, we uh, are reliant on others' competence and their willingness to look after rather than harm when what is entrusted in their care. This is a, um, from Annette Baer, who we are also very inspired by, a philosopher. Um, and we've created this model um, that describes what, what she is um, showing. And this is a model that we have developed based on a, a large empirical study that we did a few years ago. Um, and basically, it's, it's describing the, the trust between um, early daycare practitioners uh, and parents. And what we're seeing is that it is important that this trust is what we call a, a, a double trust or mutual trust. So parents are trusting their practitioners, but practitioners are also trusting the parents. And it is, um, we have both the, the, the level which is the, the, the competence level. So parents trust that the practitioners are competent to take care of this, their child, but parents also have to trust that the parents are willing or the practitioners are willing to take care of the child. So, so both dimensions are um, need to be, be there. And at the same time as trust is, we said it's a spontaneous um, phenomenon. So it's, it's not something that we're in control of, but what we're seeing is as soon as there is um, distrust, there is a, um, a, a, a tendency to perform these, this trustworthiness. So uh, if parents fear that the practitioners are not trusting them, then they start to perform in ways where they're trying to show, well, you can trust me, I am trustworthy. So trust has, really briefly, it has like a moral basis rooted in the interdependency and the sort of inherent vulnerability of the subject. So when I um, hand over my child to a daycare practitioner, I put myself in a vulnerable position where I uh, have to trust that the practitioner will, uh, is both willing and competent to actually take care of my child. But trust must also be understood as emerging in a, a cultural normative order. So the ways in which, um, the appropriate ways in which the practitioner should take care of the child is, um, is rooted in this, these cultural ideas of what is the good way of taking care of a child. So in one context, um, it is appropriate to, to, to be an adult with a child in one way, and in another context, in another country, it would be appropriate in another way. So it's a very cultural, um, uh, cultural practice, how we appropriately uh, live up to uh, the expectations that are, uh, that are given us when we take care of children. So trust must always be analyzed in this sort of cultural normative order. Trust is always a dynamic, situational, and shaped by personal experiences. So um, trust is always something that's, a, that's emerging in this concrete situation or being eroded in this concrete situation is also rooted to particular situations. So, so basically, um, I may trust my uh, a daycare practitioner to take care of my child, but I would not trust that practitioner to take uh, to if my if my car broke down, for instance, and say that that practitioner could could take care of my car and fix my car. So, so in that sense, it's it's very situational what we trust. Um, and when we trust a, pers a person. And it's also shaped by personal experiences. So if a parent, for instance, has experiences from a, a previous daycare, then they will enter into a new daycare um, more sort of risk aware, more um, with, with a higher sense of distrust than trust. Whereas parents who have positive experiences with, with daycare previously will have, have a less distrust and will enter into the new daycare with a higher sense of trust. Um, so that's the last part of this model we just want to add is that we can have sort of a thin trust or a thick trust, but these are not crystallized, so they could be very dynamic as well. We can have, in one conversation, we can move from, from a, a thin trust where the, the distrust is not something that we're paying attention to, 
um, but it's but it's maybe there a little bit. Or we can move over to, to no trust, where where the distrust is, is what is most um, pervasive in our attention. Or we can have a thick trust, where, where there's nothing, where we're not aware of the risks um, and not paying attention to them. Okay, so we will present very briefly the case that we have started uh, um, analyzing. But basically, it has to do with a Facebook page that a group of parents have created after the government decided to reopen Denmark after a month of lockdown. And the government decided to do it first by opening daycare centers and the school up to the fifth grade, it means children until uh, up to 10 years old, more or less. But the rest of Denmark remained it locked down. So this created a lot of agitation in the media and also in this group of parents, particularly that created this uh, Facebook webpage that you can see here. And um, what I want to point out mostly about uh, it here is that it has 40,000 followers, which represents uh, around if all the followers were parents with children, it will represent about 5% of uh, parents with children in Denmark. So, so it's not a, a small amount of people that actually have been expressing themselves here. And what I like, uh, or what we have been discussing, is that one of the purposes for open it has to do with a uh, sentence that I have highlighted here, that it says, our children, the one we love most, are really the ones we're going to open Denmark with first. So that's the main purpose of this, uh, this page. And our rich question was, how does the distrust of a small children's parents in the institutions of education and care emerge? Because we're talking about daycare and we're talking about schools here too. Um, and the data set, again, um, I'm running a bit of time. Um, it's what we're going to present today. It's an analysis that we made of a long post that received more than 1,700 um, likes and um, thumbs ups and uh, hearts um, and 571 comments and it is a letter that a mother wrote directed to the Prime Minister of Denmark in which she is expressing her concerns and, and her hesitations um, and the interesting thing is that this mother is also a pedagogue so actually it is someone working in the kindergartens and working in the nurseries eventually um, so when we are looking at this material, we're trying to understand from where is this distrust emerging? What are the sources that are behind? And we use uh, our model uh, as an analytical lens for looking at it. So first we try to identify where was the threshold of uh, risk. And of course, we're in a situation of pandemia, which have changed our everyday conditions, every, everyday life conditions, and have put new challenges, uh, both at work and at home. So there is a, a generalized sense of uh, we are at risk here. But what happens here is that there is a shift between someone that says that has been believing and uh, trusting the government so far, and that now they feel that they are being left behind and that, as it's quoted here, you failed us. And particularly this quotation, she says, until Monday, 8 p.m., that was the moment in which the prime minister announced this, for the first time in a long time, I felt a strong government in my back, a clear government with concrete and clear messages. It has created balance in a serious imbalance period for me. But on Monday at exactly uh, A2, you left a large group of people, left with too many unresolved questions. It is interesting to see that um, the trust was placed in this abstractness of uh, the government and their decisions. But when it comes to change and shift into the distrust, now we are personalizing it in the figure of the prime minister. We haven't done more an analysis of that, but it is, it, it is interesting in itself that it has to become personalized in someone to refer to and make accountable for. And where are actually the vulnerabilities here presented? One of them certainly is in the fact that we're talking about our small children. So she says, why the little ones, Medi Freixen is the name of our prime minister. Uh, why let such a large group of people come out and mingle with each other? Those who can understand the concept of keeping distance and washing hands. But there is also the, in the other side is the vulnerability of parents 
So you're also putting parents at risk. It's a family with children that are being at risk. And in a way, by sending children, children are perceived as being the Trojan horses. They're going to bring back, eventually, the cis back home. So you are endangering us as family with children. So it, she says, you deliberately chose to play Russian roulette with kids, with me and other parents. None of us yet uh, know yet who will survive Corona, but we know that none of us uh, parents will do. And this, when the, the, when the risk emerges in this way, it starts putting a filter into how people are understanding things. And certainly there is more consciousness about understanding what are the reasons behind certain decisions. So in general, this post uh, shows that there is um, this idea that there's something hidden, that is something that is not being told. So in a way, the lack of information is being interpreted as the prime minister being dishonest and lying openly. So it says it's really about parents having work peace. That was the argument that the prime minister gave. So she's, she's uh, questioning her. Is that a real reason? And another parent comments, um, this is a child experiment. And I'm happy that more uh, have opened their eyes to what is being unsaid. And also she, she comes even more harsh at the, at the end of her comments saying, because you are not real. Uh, that was something that Mede did not show at that press conference. Failure to give reasons and reports during this time creates this trust of you as the Prime Minister of Denmark. It creates unrest in us as citizens. It's really fucking bad. So this adds up into also starting to um, shake in and question the Nordic tradition um, which is the normative order in, uh, by which all of us are oriented them, ourselves here. So the first uh, um, thing that happened has to do with uh, enforced uh, choices. And I'm not going to read the quotations, but what I want to say is that mostly parents that were in the school um, of children school age, they are enforced to send their children. Otherwise, they will get uh, consequences in the child paychecks. Mm -hmm. um, and that, in a way, is perceived as a weak and trustworthiness into the parents' competencies, because in a way they are taking away a responsibility that the parents should take and are being punished for. Um, they are being perceived as these meaningless uh, top-down uh, decisions, where they, they say children will not understand what it means to keep distance, so why even you are thinking of making them do that? Mm -hmm. There is also an idea of there is a lack of education or perspective on it. Everything is about health. Everything is about how we keep ourselves healthy without taking into consideration the educational practice. And in that sense, this creates a, weakness, a weakened uh, trustworthiness in the prime minister. And then the new, uh, um, not the new, but another um, normative order comes into play, which is the protection of children. And parents are not seeing uh, the prime minister as being able or willing or have the competences for protecting children. And that leads to a partial loss of trust because parents are not sending their children now for this time being. And the, uh, this finish, uh, the, the post finished saying, I want to tell you that my kids are not going to participate in this round of your R Russian, R Russian roulette. I will be a big no, big no thanks from us, from here. So uh, thank you for your attention. And I think that we took a little bit more than we should, uh, but uh, that uh, was our presentation. Uh, here? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I think with that last 30 seconds, we might actually get the transition going into Akumi's presentation. So we all have our um, questions at the end, if that works for you. Yes, okay, sir. so over. thank you very much. Over to you, Akumi. Okay, thank you. But you'll need to stop um, sharing your screen, please, Paula. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Where, where Time. do I do that? Time, uh, um, isn't it? No, it's something here. Yeah, there. Stop sharing. Yes, yes thank you. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, um, hello. This is Ikumi. Uh, can you see my view slide? Okay. Yes. Um, my title is How COVID-19 Crisis Affect Higher Education in Japan. And this is an explanatory research by university instructors. And we are a group of five uh, university instructors, but unfortunately, other four panelists are having uh, classes today and they may not be uh, coming to the presentation. So I'm gonna present instead uh, on behalf of them. Background of the study, uh, as you know, the Japan is also exper experiencing the school closures and the rapid transition to remote learning as other regions too. But it seems not yet the academia has argued the stakeholders experiences. So that's why we're gonna take this issue for this presentation. Uh, this is an example of a university response to a COVID-19. This is my university's case. In Akumi, Ari, could in you Ari um, take mm -hmm. it up to full screen because we can't read the, Okay. it won't appear full screen for you, but it's, it's only appearing on the, the slide sorter at the moment. So we can't read the, mm -hmm. the text. about this? No. Uh, just presentation mode, the little champagne glass down the bottom right. Mm. Ah, right. Mm, shall I again? More about yeah. this? Okay, yes. thank you. Um, this is the one of the example of university response to COVID-19. This is my university. In Ari generally, there's a, a villas news from the Wuhan and a student from China started to consider not returning home or returning home for the spring festival, etc. Then uh, in Japan, spring is the end of the academic year. So university decided not to hold the graduation ceremony in early March. And they have also decided not to have the entrance uh, ceremony in the April. Then they have decided to give the remote classes uh, in mid of the March, uh, starting from the April. The movement of Japanese university has been very quite different. And my university decided to offer a distance learning quite early uh, in relation to other universities in Japan. Okay. Then the first post of the study and the method of the study. We aim to explore how Japanese university are experiencing the challenges in COVID-19 crisis through the instructor lives. The procedure of our study is first, our, uh, we, the presenters who are all university faculty members, uh, we recorded what, they, we, what we felt, observed, interviewed people around us, and what we found in media, such as newspapers and social media. Then we analyzed the data by thematic analysis. Then we considered a part of our data from cultural psychological perspective, because we are all our culture uh, psychology uh, followers. Okay, our profit, four of us um, collected the data we are all female. We put the alphabet instead of our names, A, B, C, D. Uh, three of us are full-time instructors of the university. One used to be a full-time, but she turned into be a part-time from this spring. And our major differs, but the three of us are nursing field, and me is a, a person A, uh, having a major as a Japanese language education. The location of the university differs, uh, the size of the university differs too, but uh, relatively small universities in Japan. We started the thematic analysis by categorizing the, all our findings of awareness that university instructor fields into the four catalogs. There are two axes, one is a uh, horizontal one, is in the left side, which is uh, related to one's own university and the right one is not related to one's own university, like outside of the university things. 
and the vertical axis refers to the things other well, either oneself or the other persons like uh, me and the family or the students or outside field in Japan and so on. As for the person A, me, you can see there are a lot of findings here in the axis of the cat lines of university and others. Most of others are uh, not the student I am teaching, but the students in general. And the colleagues, including part-time instructors, are often refers to. Like I was thinking, um, most of the students are really it should be very sad because they fail to have the ceremonies such as entrance uh, ceremony or the graduation ceremony or I would think in unemployment of the part-time lectures if the many uh, overseas students may not come to our university that kind of thing. As for the person B, most of the others in the Catalan is the real student of B is teaching. And because she has experience in the healthcare field, the ratio is uh, ratio of the other is high. Oh no, no, the relationship with the healthcare workers are often differs. Like she respect the person in working at the front line of the healthcare, that she is worrying about her uh, friends in the healthcare field, or she is thinking about the student who should be practicing in the hospital and so on. And the ratio of the others is higher than me. This is the person C. Uh, she felt the overlap between the personal thing and the professional work is often described. And she deepens the thought about the connection with society that was usual before the COVID-19 epidemic. So she realized what was usual for her and so on. And she used to be a full-time, but now she is a part-time lecturer. So she, uh, the her issues on the class preparation differed from a part-time extractor's perspective. Like a uh, late notification from the university makes a late preparation for her and so on. This is the person D. Uh, D made more findings on the all over the four catalogs. And many issues are on the axis. So she thought she is hard to classify whether it is oneself or the other person things or which is related to the university work or not. So by now, findings of the thematic analysis, there are things in common, mostly three. The crisis felt is not limited to just technical issues such as the use of tools for conducting distance learning and so but in terms of student support like this includes not only immediate classes but also long-term support such as practical training can be done red qualification for acquiring some or certificate or not uh, graduation can be late or not, or employment can be good enough or not, and such and so. And it also spans support for learning method, like mental health care and a friendship building for the students. The third common thing is the fear of infection. It's not only seen about themselves, I mean, but ourselves, but also about the families or the acquaintances and the friends, which manifests itself in relation to the faculty ourselves our mental health if the family uh, infected then that makes our mental health worse or make the work like balance worse that kind of thing the difference is too uh, those who have experience in the medical field or have contacts in the medical field that is the three of us will have the, this kind of experience have acquaintances or on the front line, or it can assume the situation in the field and the spend time was a medical field in the past. So they have more concerns and conflicts or guilty with those persons. The second differences in job description uh, reflect in the differences in areas of concern. Like I myself having a director of the program. So I thought about the part-time lecturers unemployment or the part-time lecturer had thought about the late notification from the university, 
or person who have the teaching practice outside the university having the teaching uh, field work and so on. That makes the difference of the soul. Then when we making the sense of COVID-19 experience in Bible analysis, all four felt our own development as well as the surroundings one as time goes. Like this is this development, the orange one was the condition left unchanged in May from the March. But the green was a feeling left unchanged in May. And the yellow refers to a slightly changed positively things. And the blue one was referring to some condition changed into positive as a result of a response to the crisis. And the red one, she felt she has gained some things according to, uh, as a result of the response to the crisis. So she felt she had to figure out which one is first and which one is late. So the, her feelings developed within the, these three months. So we decided to analyze the development more. Uh, cultural psychology understand the people as developing system within the developing social context, as Valfina said. So we, uh, in what social and cultural context are we developing? This is my development about the thoughts of stigma. We, uh, I use it, I analyze this one by using the KJ method by Kawakita. It's uh, roughly saying it's making the brainstorming thing, what I felt, and making the group and put the names on the category and what kind of uh, uh, relationship between the elements and so on. And I found that the all three main uh, elements of my thought, one is the action. I should do something to make a society where diverse members of the society can live in peace, which consists of three ideas my duties as a liberal arts university faculty and uh, my duty as a teaching language as a media to communicate diverse people or my responsibility since i'm in the blessed environment i don't have any fear about the uh, unemployment and so on or the issues i should do for myself i have a um, conflict between within my family having the the kind of stigma thing. So I have to uh, conquer the situation for myself too. And the issues is problem in building a society where diverse people can live together. And that expanded to how to solve the situation. And firstly, I thought about the minority thing, but later on I found that it's not enough, but we have to know our privilege to have an inclusive society. So this, this is the summary of my thoughts according to the KJ method. Uh, in a society where diverse members can live in peace, everyone should be generous with others, but the COVID-19 increases intolerance of others. However, legitimate the again alone does not solve the problem well, but rather each person needs to be aware of one's own privilege. Along with that, it would be effective to build a relationship where one can know the other person's face and consider the problem from broader perspectives. I must work for constructing such a society as my own issue, as my profession, who are teaching a language in a liberal arts university, and even as my responsibility since I'm in the blessed circumstances. Then, Reflecting how I came at this thought, I noticed that it has a lot to do with what I experience and feel at home, as well as what I see and hear in the mass media, social media, and what I experience at work. And I was interested in how this is developed in the stream of time. So I used the analysis of a trajectory if we find out the modeling, which is called TEM by Yasuda and so on. Um, this is a TEM. Uh, I wrote, Tim wrote, Tim writes, uh, time using the erasable stream of time from left to right, left is the past and the light is a future. And we put the things I have done or possibly done in the light gray, uh, light purple circle. Like we studied the don't beat up on China, then don't expel the foreigners, 
then we can go, I can go to the preserve the freedom of moving across the borders, but I didn't took that line, but I came to interception is necess necessary to prevent the spread of infection, that kind of thing. So the thick line shows what I have done, really. And the dot line uh, refers to the possibly line of stream. And the orange one, is the power to strengthen me to not to go to my favorite desirable future. The blue one having a power shows the power which uh, forced me to go to the desirable future. Then first, I was thinking my desirable future is society, making a society without excluding foreigners. But later on, I found a my desirable future is cooperation and well-being in the post-COVID-19. So this is my development of the thought about the stigma. Then I was interesting what happened these two points because I could have the alternative line but I didn't choose what happened here so that I could choose this one. Then uh, have you heard of uh, imagination uh, analysis by Zitten. I used that method. There is a timeline and something happened as a trigger and one makes an imagination using the resource that the one has. And after the re as a result of the resources and triggers, we pull out uh, some outcomes from the imagination. And this is my first imagination at the point of uh, no China uh, expectation. Uh, the trigger was avoidance of China Chinese by some people in uh, all over the world, just like the Wuhan virus and so on, by saying Wuhan virus and so on. Then I made the imagination using the resource like past experience as the 9-11 in America with the three uh, 11 uh, Tohoku region in Japan earthquake or everyday life experience, multinational and transnational uh, experience in my university or the future prospects, the danger of fostering the stigma and discrimination and so on. Then the outcome is encourage others not to beat up on China, China. That's my first imagination. But later on, I found a different imagination um, the trigger was news and media, including social media, what or what a acquaintance and family said. But the resource is more. Of course, it's a past experience, but it's not only the 9-11 and 3-11, but also minority students and acquaintances of the loveness of the uh, mailing list during the 9-11 and so on or the knowledge I have about the history and the social in the situations in the worldwide level, or study of privilege and minorities on literature, or the daily lives and the prospects for the future. Then the outcomes becomes encourage others to know one's privilege and act on it. And I found that when I compared the DC imagination, I found that the difference is high level of abstraction not only the foreigners or the China, but also all inclusive, like a uh, student was uh, not enough fee to uh, continue the student work and so on. All the rich resources, including the literature. Literature gives me implausible uh, resources. I, I made a mistake, resources from the literature. So then uh, this is a three-layer model of the Genesis, uh, which uh, written in the Sato 2015 and so. I have the value at the third level, peace life is very important. And I have done the things, the activity at the first layer, don't be China and don't expect fun and so on. But how this activity comes from the peace life when people want to have the peace life, one can beat China or the beat the foreigners in making a peace life, but I could, I didn't because I have the sign or to promote me to the peace life, such as stigma and the discrimination is not good. Or you can't do by something self-help alone or the physical health is important. 
that kind of uh, sign made me to act like these things in the first layer. If I make, uh, if I analyze more uh, in depth how these signs are uh, constituted, then I can see the difference between me and others and find out how to you know, resolve the situation altogether. We have done the other uh, co-presenters made their uh, three layers model of genesis by their own things. Like B's colleague, colleague had uh, things about the, their classes. She was thinking about the classes and she finally thought about the classes are created together with the student. She had to do the remote classes, then student complains about the remote learning. Then she had the reflection about that. And later on the follow up from the senior student who have completed the training so far and then they helped the new student to study well and she found out that classes are created together with the system, not only by the teacher. Or the other person, uh, C, thought about her life, and this is her doing at the bottom. And she's thinking student, faculty, and organization as a whole are reviewing the state of education together. Then we are reaching at the end. Uh, why we focus on the individual development? Cultural psychology studies not to separate social and the cultural context and situation from the individual, but turns it, it turns its attention to the symbols and the meaning that constitute the human act that relies with them and their transformation by Sato and Kido. And individual focus case studies have the utility transferability, uh, transferability as a model for similarly situated practitioners. So we all for having the different experience, different lives, if we analyze the symbols which forces us to do something, or what is the value that we have more in depth, then that applies to other practitioners too. That's what we thought about. So. It is meaningful to further explore how university faculty members live and make sense the COVID-19 experience and what kind of social and cultural context and the symbols are involved in it. We have done by uh, this much and this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. It's very interesting, Akumi. You've come in two minutes under mm. under budget, so um, <laughs> time for a quick question. If anyone has one, I've got a few for later on. Actually, I might ask you one. Um, just a few slides ago, you mentioned one of your colleagues, um, B, his colleague B, mm -hmm. um, and it was concerned about not being able to live up to what you've been through. Could you um, elaborate what what that means? Not being able to live up to what you've been through. Let me see. You said B? Yeah. Oh, there you go. The shock of not being able to live up to what you've been through. Oh. Oops. Bottom right. Yeah. Uh, she, she had the uh, confidence, the, the colleague of the B had the confidence what to do as a teacher or the professor, but by receiving the student complaint, she found out that she cannot do, she cannot continue the things as she thought. Did that make sense? Okay, so can't function how she'd like to. Yeah, right. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. That's wonderful. Very good. Okay, so our next, um, next presentation is from Eva Voss and Alan Rayner, both from Sydney, I believe. You've got a 25 minute video. Um, so, uh, thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you, everybody. I think actually Alan is in the UK. <laughs> He's definitely not in Sydney. Um, but um, we are doing a shared presentation, which is recorded. So I'm just going to share my screen.
and I will start and please hi, uh, indicate if it's um, um, audible, if everything is okay. Um, so this is a shared screen and it should have audio. So welcome everybody. Uh, this is a uh, conversation, a recorded conversation with um, Alan Rayner um, and Eva Wasch. Alan is based in the UK and I'm based in um, Australia. So we decided to record this conversation as part of our presentation for the conference. And in this conversation, I take uh, the role of uh, the interviewer and I'd like to interview or um, approve Alan uh, to introduce um, his vision of natural, natural inclusionality to a wider audience. And um, I'd like to ask, first of all, Alan, I'd like to ask you um, to briefly introduce uh, natural inclusionality to our audience. Natural inclusion, to my mind, is a fundamental evolutionary principle and it enables us to understand the, the true nature of reality as a varied expression of natural energy flow around and between local receptive centres of space. Now that's a very short way of describing it, uh, which take, will take quite a long time to uh, unpack and to understand. I could put it a little bit another way. Um, when I like to put it is beneath the complex surface of appearance, beneath the complex surface appearance of reality lies a simple truth, a dance between infinite receptive spatial void and local responsive energetic motion. Darkness and light co-creatively combined in myriad variations around a simple central theme. And perhaps you'd like to show at this stage an image of my painting, Holding Oats, which is really uh, an image, that painting celebrating this dance between, this co-creative dance between darkness and light, called Holding Openness. Can you find that? Yes, I, I mean, I think that we, you know, that image to me, I painted it in 2005 and it, it really sums up uh, the basic understanding I have of, of, of natural inclusion in terms of this relationship, this receptive, responsive relationship between a center of space which calls energy into motion around itself. And from, in this way, we can understand how all material bodies, including our own human bodies, from subatomic scale outwards, come into being and diversify as flow forms. So we understand all material forms as flow forms. We understand them as mutual inclusions of void space and circulating energy in receptive, responsive relationships. And when we come down to it and think about that, this is actually an expression of ancient spiritual wisdom in a modern scientific guise that appreciates the artfulness of all life on earth. I love In what you're describing, you're actually describing something bigger, more complex than um, what we understand as, 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 as the science of nature as such, or the understanding of nature. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm going beyond the objectivistic view of, of nature uh, that comes from a per purely third person uh, approach to scientific inquiry. So it involves, you know, instead of divorcing subject from object, as has become traditional in science, 
and speaking only or, or viewing the world only from out, outside inwards and so only seeing so that our vision stops at the surface of what we observe and objectifies them. Uh, I'm using, I'm, I'm, I'm also using uh, an approach that speaks from within. So I'm essentially combining outside inwards kinds of points of view and inside outwards points of view. If you like, I'm combining first person subjective, third person objective. Of viewing reality and putting those together in a creative way, which, if you like, is like a second person mm. uh, point of view, where 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 we actually have a more intimate understanding of what we're observing in relation to one another, and that's very important mm -hmm. uh, to to bring empathy for whatever it is you're observing into the way into your understanding and it's not anthropomorphism because anthropomorphism is just trying to put a human mind into the place of what's being observed this the empathic approach is truly to imagine how it feels to be in the place of what you're observing and my feeling is that all global crises the ones that we're currently experiencing arise from false or partially false culturally embedded perceptions of human nature and or the nature of reality okay so we're, we're dealing with the problem the problems all arise from false or partially false culturally embedded perceptions of our own human nature and the nature of and, and the nature of reality and those false or partially false perceptions cause psychological, social and environmental harm. And we've been teaching ourselves to think or perceive the world, if you like, for, a very, for many years, for thousands of years actually, in a way that causes harm. And harm manifests in the crises uh, that we're observing and it manifests all the more the more that we have globalized particular ways of thinking, particular perceptions of reality, which are actually false or partially false. So just to give you an example of such a false perception, I could mention the perception that life is a struggle for ex a competitive struggle for existence. That's a widespread perception of reality uh, encouraged by D Darwinism and it is actually arises from a purely objectivistic way of viewing the natural world from outside inwards mm -hmm. without taking any account of the internal workings and, yeah, of what is being observed. And so you arrive at this false perception. Now, if you then spread that perception far and wide through the culture, you teach it in schools, how is that going to make you behave? You get, if, we, if we go all going around with this perception that life is a competitive struggle for existence, how are we going to behave in relation to one another and in relation to our natural environment, our natural neighborhood? And we see that, you know, once we've, those sorts of perceptions are deeply embedded, that we're going to come across situations again and again and again that we can't think our way out of because we're stuck with an attitude of mind that says, this is the reality. <laughs> and we re literally cannot begin to imagine a different reality. When you talk about the, the harmful nature of this thinking, um, and I think it would be really useful to apply it to the current situation where um, working are way through this crisis is described as a fight as a competition as a war so it's a lack of understanding of what we're dealing with but also a, 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 the, maybe a, a forced perception of uh you know um enemy as opposed to something to better understand and and work with as a yeah. fight against. I mean, is is that this is there's an attitude of mind that make of the, of the human mind that makes an enemy of the other, 
and that leads us to go to go to war with what we perceive as an en enemy um, and instead of instead of deeply understanding uh, the fundamental nature of what we're dealing with or, or, or working with so I mean one of the ways that I find that we can get out of that habit um, is to understand that all all organisms, all living creatures, are needful. They, that 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 is how you know we get hungry. <laughs> can bring us into rivalry with others. We, we, it can be that the case that our needs don't coincide with our, with with others, but that doesn't make us selfish. That doesn't make us you know, <clears throat> you know that that doesn't necessarily put us at odds with others but we can understand one another's needs um, so you know a virus needs human cells to reproduce uh, and that's how it is um, it's not at war with us it's looking for a home in us that's a very different way of thinking about what the virus is actually doing it's found a home and what we actually have to do as human beings is say, terribly sorry, there's no room here. And, and a, you know, a huge amount of, you know, natural history programs and the rest these days, you know, are, are totally imbued with the idea of, 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 of competition uh, and warfare and all those sort of, that sort of imagery. But if we replace that with an understanding of need, we get a different feeling. Mm -hmm. Natural territoriality, and I've made great studies of natural territoriality, parasitism, all the rest of it. They are not the same as ideological conflict. That is a human thing, okay? That is a purely human exercise of, to actually make an enemy of the other. And a number of people talk about, you know, mention the great lie, um, how we lie to ourselves about the reality of our own nature and of, of, and of, of the nature of reality. And this great lie has the effect of severing or subsuming the uniqueness of individual self-identity from or within group identity and nature. It results in profound human conflict, oppression, psychological, social and environmental harm, but it continues to be perceived and promulgated as literal truth by those holding, seeking or subservient to hierarchical power. So we're looking at power relationships here and we're looking at why we would be tempted, almost in a biblical sense, why we would be tempted to deny the reality, our human reality and the reality of the world that we inhabit. And ultimately we may do that as a, combina as a powerful combination of fear of the, of the other, fear of, 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 of fear of death, of course, in human beings is very strong, fear of uncertainty is very strong, and associated with that fear, a kind of tunnel vision or partial view of reality, so that we deny an aspect of reality that we don't want to admit. Okay, we think of yeah, we think of matter as the material aspect of reality, space as the immaterial aspect. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we if we we can either regard that those two as being mutually exclusive, excluding one another or in opposition. We can, we can speak of a battle between light and darkness because that's what we're talking about here. <laughs> yes, and we often do. Or we can say, oh, we're all one. And we, we, we essentially try to remove any notion that there can be, that, that natural forms can have boundary limits at all. Yeah can have constraining boundaries. So we get into this battle between philosophical dualism and philosophical non-dualism. And both of them are paradoxical. Both of them are, are based on a partial way of viewing reality. So that's the great lie. 
and the effect that it has is if we just imagine all is one then we have essentially eliminated the idea that we have, an, have unique individual identities we've killed our we've killed ourselves identity yeah on the other hand and, and you know this, this is sometimes regarded as a great thing oh i have no self okay if on the other hand we we regard matter and space or the material of the immaterial to be mutually exclusive then we've set up a battleground yeah we have dislocated our sense of self-identity and made us a kind of an encapsulated yep objectified form against its surroundings and that's the origin of the idea of the struggle for life and you know a, a friend of mine once described it as we make ourselves orphans from our natural source And that's exactly what happens. We then behave in a disoriented way at odds with where we've come from yes. and at odds with one another. And that, I guess that lack of coherence often from its source is really powerful in, in, in kind of understanding of the helplessness of um, the science that produced or the mindset that yeah. produced the problems that we are facing at the moment how could it yeah. find the solution to the problems that it generated um, yeah. and and are generated from its own narrowness now yeah. is there an image that we could use to illustrate this so that's the painting that i made after a year of of uh, of doctoral research mm -hmm. and you know, I was a naturalist, I was in love with the natural world, I wanted to understand the world that I was observing, but I was, had been taught to practice science in this objectivistic way, which had the effect of cutting me off as, as the cloaked observer <laughs> from what I was trying to understand uh, as, as the observed, and there was a barrier a massive barrier, a construction, and, and, and if you like, uh, in the way of actually immersing my understanding in the world that I wanted to understand. So that is the image which I called Willow Bridge. I painted it, as I say, in 1974, uh, when I was in my second year of research. And it's, it's about, it's really about the, um, relationships between two the two different kinds of perception uh, and the chasm that can open up between them but also how we can find the middle way between the that brings both into relationship with one another see the, the empty shell of the boat okay representing the soul is making its way through between it's negotiating its way between these yeah Mm -hmm. These uh, seemingly opposed and bringing them into mutual partnership, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Instead of setting them at odds, that's it's sort of it's an extraordinary painting. I never understood it at the time, <laughs> but as I looked at it more and more and more over the years since, I see this as a symbol of the journey that I actually was making towards natural inclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which brings those two seemingly opposed worldviews into dynamic mm -hmm. relationship with one another, into co-creative dynamic relationship with one another. At this time of quite strong and deep hopelessness or sense of hopelessness, um, I'm, I'm wondering how once again, natural inclusionality can actually bring that hope, can bring those uh, new vistas, new kind of uh, understandings that are needed to rise above or resurface. You know, just, uh, just recently I, I wrote this down and this is why I do see how, and I do see 
the possibility of resurgence. I see that when we recognize what the deep, the deep falsehoods and divisions that reside behind our global crises, of which symptom, um, that, that the, virus, the spread of the virus is associated with over-networking, essentially, literally, it's a product of globalization in many, many, in many, many ways. Uh, and uh, and the, the economic system that we've concocted and all those sorts of things which actually you know it's actually going over to that we're all we're all we've got to all be connected kind of attitude in one in one mass rather than actually recognize that there are good reasons <laughs> for not over connecting you know and that's you know real biological and ecological and evolutionary reasons for not doing it but so that's just one example um when we can actually begin to see uh you know what's been lying behind so many of our difficulties and we also begin to experience as many of us have experienced in this period of astonishing calm within the storm where we suddenly hear the bird song we suddenly have an unpolluted unpolluted skies and we think what on earth have we been doing isn't this now a time to reflect reconsider understand how how we got into this difficulty that's where my hope resides because i've always felt that human nature is fundamentally loving truthful and extraordinarily imaginative and that is those qualities that, that reside at the heart of our individual and collective creativity and ability to learn those are the qualities that are our greatest human asset. That we can be misled to be, be, believe and behave otherwise is due to that powerful combination of fear and partial perception, which manifests in what I call this great lie that has become so deeply culturally embedded. And the only way to escape the influence of that falsehood is literally to educate ourselves out of it. And that's really what that last painting of mine was doing. And it's a demonstration of leading yourself out of the conflict <laughs> yeah, that arises from a false, a false dichotomy. Yeah between worldviews which are which are based on partial perceptions but are actually complementary and i think it also shows you know for me as a scientist i've always practiced art to try and balance myself and increasingly it shows me that you know you can't argue your way out of it you can't rationalize your way out of these these crises but art or in all its forms offers us an approach an educational approach especially that can enable us to lead our way out of what we have put we of what of, of the of the whole with the w that we've 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 entrapped ourselves within so we can lead our way out of this entrapment and that's the that's where the resurgence comes that's where the hope in my mind lies the recognition of the of the need both for individual nonconformity and for collective coherence not one or other in opposition but both in co-creative relationship so i think thank you so much for this i think this is really powerful and i guess the idea of hope um, through a change of mindset, but not necessarily simply shifting from one to the other, but maybe bringing 
different perspectives together in natural inclusionality um, in the midst of, of, of the crisis. This is how we can understand it, its uh, value and significance in, in um, resurfacing from the current sense of hopelessness or uh, sense of uh, loss. So I guess that's, um, I stop sharing and I have, um, can kind of go on to our fourth presenter. Um, and Brandon is just gonna start uh, his talk. Yes, thank you for that. I can see why it was hard for you to um, edit it down because there's some very deep ideas going on there and hard to um, end any of them midstream, but I'm sure we'll pick up some of those in a moment. Okay, well, John and I introduce ourselves within this, so I'm going to start sharing, and here we go. Welcome to, the, um, to this session. I'm John Cripps clark I'm teacher and research at, in education at uh, Deakin University. And I'm Brendan Jacobs, and I do similar things at CQ University at the Mackay City campus in Queensland. I know John from when I used to live in Melbourne, which is where Deakin University is from. And in addition to our interest in Vygotsky, we're both teachers of science. And we thought it was interesting to point out that um, one of the greatest scientists of all time, of course, so, uh, Isaac Newton did some of his best work while he was actually working from home during the bubonic plague. So easier said than done, but um, crises such as these have, have been happening um, routinely for several centuries, as we know. And I think the idea of refraction has a number of really quite important ideas sitting behind it. But it's also um, provided a lot of um, very strong metaphors. And one of those metaphors that I'd like to bring forward, which has been important to, to us, um, is the idea of the refraction caused by Perishevania. Perishevania being a term that Vygotsky brought into play to try and understand why different individuals with the same experience, the same social experience, become different, have different intellectual and emotional reactions to them. And so one of the important things that we do within the groups that we're going to talk about is that um, we build a collective perigevania, collective consciousness, um, by the social situation of development that we place ourselves in. And that social situation of development is the reading group and subsequently the summer school that we want to talk about. So the, the reading group in the summer school, we will talk about, there's a third item as well, which is the Australian Association of Research and Education has a special interest group of which there are about 15, I think. And, and one of them, is sociocultural activity theory. And John and I, and this lady here, Judy McCallum, we're the three co-conveners of that group. So that's a different context as well, because it's an annual meeting. It's been canceled this year. And the summer school was often held immediately after that, because people that have traveled from wherever they might be in the world have come together. So it was a logical thing to do. But this year, our summer school has been canceled as well. The summer school is a fairly recent thing, but the, the original catalyst to all this was the reading group, which, which you started, John. I believe it was about 20 years ago now. Yes, it's been going for a remarkably long period of time. Almost 90 people who are members of it who um, particularly enjoy getting the, the readings each month and then meeting, well, some of us for an hour late in the afternoon so that teachers can come um, to... Uh, to discuss that reading. So we're gonna put all the dynamics and, and different parts of, of these three um, types of meetings together, but first by way of introduction. So you might be familiar with this triangle, which is quite contentious in some ways, because it's, it's um, Engstrom has come up with this triangle. It's called the second generation one and the third generation one, but it started with the idea of um, that Vygotsky had with the subject, the mediating artifact and the object. So what, what we've done with that today, we've used this second generation one 
and we've used it as a metaphor for a prism where we've shown what the different um, dynamics are in play with our various um, contexts for when we get together. So the subject, it's Vygotsky's the common element. Um, John and I were saying recently, we don't think everything that Vygotsky ever said or did is perfect. We don't want to deify him in that sense. But um, not all of the readings are by Vygotsky, but they all seem to have some relation to sociocultural activity theory. And what we really want to talk today about is, is the tools, because um, technology has enabled us to, to meet in different ways, especially at the moment. And that's also reflected in the community that we've um, that has been established over the years, the online and the face to face one. And I think one of the important things to think about in this context where we actually are reproducing what we've been doing with the reading group, i.e. at present we're meeting um, purely in the electronic realm, is that we want to emphasize that the movement between face to face and online is not just a one-way thing. Um, and we need to think much more seriously about what, what occurs in that and try and understand it. And one of the tools we want to use is, is this way of understanding social practice, which is the activity system, the activity triangle here developed by Audio and Gestrom. Um, so what we've experienced in the crisis is in fact a movement from face to face for most people to being online and interacting electronically. And that has sometimes been fairly seamless, sometimes it's been quite traumatic. Um, the case study that we want to look at is a case study where we've moved from being online to moving face to face. So originally this group, whose basic raison d'etre is to further our individual understandings of the ideas of Vygotsky and how those have evolved in the subsequent 80 years or so, um, but also to form a, a collective understanding and a community which shares and, and works on these ideas. And that started 20 years ago partly face-to-face, -face, but mostly electronically. So we'd meet by phone or by video link each month, and we'd meet around a, um, a mediating artifact, which was the readings, um, and bring our ideas together. That subsequently moved into the um, special interest group, which was both electronic during the year, but was very much face to face each year at the um, annual conference of the organisation. Now the organisation is much bigger than the, the special interest group and is a, a big shaggy monster of a thing. Um, but it did give a coherence to that and in fact that enabled the final evolution of what's happened which is to go to um, intense face to face um, engagement with each other and with the ideas in the form of summer school. So the summer school goes for about five days. It's residential. We're with each other the whole time. Basically, we're discussing ideas of cultural, historical and activity theory from you know, the time we wake up at about 7 a.m. till when we go to bed about 10, 11. Well, we're not big ragers anymore, at least I'm not. Um, and so that, that movement to being face-to-face -face has actually been a way of of deepening and, and changing the way that the social situation development has been able to be expressed and how that has been refracted through the collective parish of Anya. So I want to talk a little bit about the affordances of the technology. So we've had this video conferencing technology for some, some years now. Some people would only ever phone in this chat facility where, where people can be typing, what I find really interesting is that when someone is speaking, um, common courtesy would say you don't interrupt them, but you would conversationally, you'd, you'd say what you wanted to when you get the opportunity. But with the chat facility, you can be typing in little questions to the group or to the speaker, and that's not considered to be 
um, rude in any way. In fact, it, it demonstrates your, your engagement with what's being said. So I think that um, that doesn't happen in a classroom, really, does it? When, when you are face to face, it's very much the old rules about who speaks and when. Whereas now I think it's opened up in some interesting ways. I think one of the ways there is that that conversation can be enable somebody who has a particular interest or a particular thing that they're trying to understand to engage with somebody who also isn't speaking but may know more about it and gradually develop their ideas. And that can come back into the, the verbal conversation or it actually can continue and build. And we have had examples where the conversation between two people, um, normally more junior, junior and a more senior uh, academic, has continued on after that via email, by a continuation of this kind of textual interaction, um, to develop quite sophisticated ideas. And um, there's been at least one example where that's led to subsequent research projects and, and, and development of the ideas in very sophisticated ways. So it's quite interesting that that affordance, which is it can occur in some ways in in a face to face, but it's actually much more natural and much more permanent. But it's a really interesting way of thinking about the new affordances that are available with the technological developments and the ways that that can lead to new ways of interacting socially, but new ways of developing ideas and therefore new ways of reasoning. Other ways of, that I've seen that chat facility used, like someone might mention a reading or a reference here or there, and rather than having to say, I'll get back to you with that, because we're all obviously on a computer, we can just quietly find that, throw that reference into the chat, and, and there it is for, for everyone to see. I think that that's really helpful. But also when we're talking about affordances here, I think it's important to note that we don't want to look at um, all the online learning as being a, a deficit model where it, it can't and, and can never be as good as face to face because what's what we're finding you and um, many people is that there are certain things such as the example we just gave about the chat that can't be done in the face to face and both yourself John and, and, and myself in our roles at our universities we're um, coordinating units that, that are um, a lot of distance and online learning so it's very much using that the flipped classroom model where people will students will engage with the resources in their own time and then when they get together um, in, in a group in my case it's the zoom sessions where there's an actual time where people can come and join and if they can't make it they can watch the video later so what what it, people realize with the flipped classroom model is that our face-to-face -face time is more valuable if we've done some sort of research behind that and that's the whole premise of the reading group is we do the reading first and then get together i thought i might ask you john as the founder of the group this division of labor these different roles are different things that you're responsible for um, there have been times because we don't always read Vygotsky but there have been times when the author of an article has been present within the group and that seems to change the dynamics where they're presenter really and an author this is always structured around the um, the object of a, of a, a, a published reading, um, and but where the author is present, it actually means that um, there is more time spent expounding and, and developing some of the ideas, and so you start from a slightly different point of view. Um, and therefore, it, it becomes, it doesn't become quite a seminar, but it has a slight, certain transition towards that. And one of the interesting things, certainly for me as the convener of the group, is the way that you balance people's desire to really hear from the author and, and engage deeply with what they're saying, to being able to develop their own ideas and making them put forward uh, contestations and developments that wouldn't otherwise be there in a, a normal seminar presentation. I mean, one of the problems that we have within many, certainly within education is that we tend to be too polite um, and trying to build a culture where we engage deeply with ideas and start to, to take them very you know, seriously such that we actually pull them apart and start to argue seriously about this 
has without you know causing ructions in the group and certainly some people get upset about that um has been a really interesting balancing act and that really comes to fore when you've got an actual author there because they have a kind of ownership and and a privilege that uh isn't isn't otherwise there and unlike a traditional online forum where people are usually usually using some sort of pseudonym with this everyone knows who they are we're all using real names from real places so i think that um, creates a different environment as well but this community of theoretical practice yeah, I think it would be fair to say that many of the participants here have gone on to publish either articles or, or uh, book chapters or even books because of that, that shared um, theoretical interest. And that's, that's what brought the whole group together. Yeah, and I think the kind of being challenged, well, certainly the kind of feedback I get by people who aren't able to turn up to the meeting but say, oh, they still appreciated the reading is that you're getting something a little bit arbitrary thrust upon you each month and it forces you to engage with something that you wouldn't otherwise engage with and that slight bit of serendipity albeit tightly constrained within a particular theoretical outlook which we all share um, is i think a stimulus to thinking things in a new way and developing your ideas and so I think that's one part of why it has been successful for two decades. I think the contribution we want to make is that it's the movement between we need to think about how and why we move between the reading group and the summer school and, and what happens at each of those and how those then inform the others. And that's what we're kind of working through at the moment in a sense, um, because that's the next step, I think, of this community of practice. This isn't... Uh, an organisation that isn't set within the social structures which most um, learning and development occurs. Yes. Within those informal structures. And as soon as we move from you know, formal social structures to these kind of informal ones. And the other thing is that because they are, uh, there isn't that kind of formal structures, it actually makes it a lot more flexible um, that it can adapt to different circumstances. And even though everyone seems to have a university affiliation, it's, it's, there's no credit involved, it's not a subject, therefore the, it's a lot more casual and informal and in how, how we meet and what we do. And I think that that's another aspect of the, the kind of division between explicit and tacit. It's all to do with tacit, it's all to do with furthering scholarship, it's to do with relationships to people. You know, it's the, the pleasure in new knowledge and people, you know, in, in, in new knowledge and research and in learning. And that kind of, it's very easy in a more formal situation for that pleasure to get lost, whereas here it becomes absolutely central. You know, it's the enjoyment we have in working through ideas in relationship to others. So our, our learning, our education, but also our, our development of new ideas. When, once you start to look at those kind of explicit and tacit rules, that starts to become more obvious that why it's successful. The present crisis is a health crisis, and that is certainly, and, and I mean, any crisis is a stimulus to, to think and to change the way that we do things. If this paper contributes anything, it's to that thinking about the relationships rather than the thing itself. So not the online or the face-to-face, -face, not the times of what we call stability and the times we call crisis, but it's the movement between those things. And I think that cultural, historical and activity theory has something to contribute there because it gives us tools for analysis and then those tools are something like the activity system, something like the idea of Parish of Anyang, something like the social situation development, these, these phrases that come from Vygotsky, these ideas that come from Vygotsky. Um, but it also gives us that emphasis on process rather than product. You know, it's the, mm. the getting there, it's the, the movement between things that's important. 
And one of the important ideas there within the activity triangle that we haven't mentioned is the idea of contradiction. We've talked about the crisis here, but crisis has at its heart the idea of a contradiction. And a contradiction is not just something going wrong, it's an opportunity for change, for development. And it's often been said that you know, nothing will be the same after the COVID crisis. But that will only occur if we understand the fundamental contradictions that are occurring in the movement from pre-crisis to crisis. And start to think about new act, uh, ways of, of living and ways of existing, new um, activities that will uh, resolve those contradictions predictions. So that kind of expansive development that Engstrom also talks about in quite interesting ways. That tool and that way of understanding has to do with crisis and contradiction, even though it may not look like that. It, it is about understanding those contradictions and moving it from being just a disruption to being a development. Okay, so we timed our video to be 20 minutes. So we might see if anyone has questions for John and I first, and then we'll head into um, 20 minutes of open questioning. And if you don't ask questions, I'll start asking questions of Brendan or of other people. So <laughs> get in first. Okay, well, I, I had some questions. Um, firstly, for Paula and Naomi, that, that model you had of the doubleness of mutual trust, so you had the practitioners and the parents, and it looked to me like the, the child wasn't, wasn't in that diagram, but it looked to me that the trust amongst the parents is, is built. Would I be right to say that for the children, it's assumed, like as a child, unless something's happen to violate that trust you would you would trust both the parents and the, the practitioners yes um yeah absolutely and i think it's a it's it's a good point that, that we we're also thinking about how how does the child fit into this this, this model mm. um and yes i <clears throat> i think it's a nice point that for for children and if we if, if we look at them um, at trust through the lens of, of Lutstrup, he would say that, well, actually for all of us, our sort of initial response to the world would be, um, is, is an assumed trust. It's, we, we approach the world uh, with trust, but then we, then we have experiences um, that make us, um, that, that makes the distrust arise. So, so as an adult, we have a lot of experiences where distrust arises. So, so if we take the really simple example of, of Goffman and civil inattention. So when I'm walking down the street, uh, if everybody is, is doing what they're supposed to be doing with the, in the normative order of how we walk down the street appropriately, which Goffman describes as we, we have really brief eye contact and we look away and there's appropriate amount of space between us and so on. If somebody violates that, um, by looking too long at me, for instance, or yelling at me or something, well then trust immediately uh, arises. So, so in that sense, from, from a Lutzstrup perspective, he would argue that actually for all of us, trust initially is assumed and distrust arises when there is a reason uh, to distrust. Um, but as an adult, we have more reasons to distrust than a child. And uh, well, I think to that, um, what we found that, of course, a big part of the trust that um, the parents are having towards the pedagogues and the, poet, uh, the pedagogues towards the parents are through the interpretation of what is happening with the child. So if the child comes, you know, with a blue, how do you call it? A bruise yeah. in the head, um, that is being interpreted as the competencies that both are having in relation to the child. Depending where the trust is, things can be be understood as well this is part of uh, a game and, and, and it just happened but it, or it can be interpreted exactly the same bruise as okay the pedagogues are not around or in the other hand these parents are not taking care of the child 
well enough. And that's why he has a bruise in the front head. So, so depending on, on how uh, strong or weak or thick or thin is the trust, the interpretations of the other through the child will, will take place differently. Uh, but differently, differently, we have been thinking about how actually the child as an uh, active agent also takes uh, place here. Um, and we're still working on that. <laughs> yeah. I love the way you call the early childhood practitioners pedagogues. Yeah, 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 it's good. It, it is a it is a brutal <laughs> translation from Danish because the Danish is pedagog. Uh, yeah, yeah, pedagogues. Just following up on that because I think that's really interesting. The way that trust is either fostered or um, undermined. And the example that you're looking at was with the face group group was really a, a matter of, of trust with relationship to the national government, the prime minister's statements, as against trust in the family unit. But there's actually a whole series of, of levels of social organisation between that. There's obviously the local community or the community that, um, of, of the parents. There is that Facebook community itself. There is the local government. Uh, did you see or observe any any kind of interactions for the way that trust was either built or um, undermined coming from other sources? So, for instance, I mean, it would have been it seemed very interesting the way the face group either fostered or undermined trust in other groups and, and within themselves and how that occurred. We, uh, we're starting to consider those because, of course, um, among the comments, there's a lot of people that says this is well written, you should send it directly to the prime minister, blah, blah, blah. But there are some others also that are questioning uh, this posture. And it says, for example, what the arguments that are using is that they trust the institution. Not, they are not referring to the government directly, but they might say, I trust that the pedagogues have the knowledge for taking care of the children and following the health guidelines. Uh, so it's not a problem to send the, the, the children. So, so the trust in the institution directly and the pedagogues directly is being used as a pro argument of sending the child back to uh, the kindergarten. Um, so yeah, there is a content analysis that we need to, to, to do about the challenges. So how, how is this discourse of not sending the children because we don't uh, believe or trust the distrust, uh, to be precise, distrust the prime minister uh, are, being, are being used and are being taken into account also by the person that build the threat or, or those that are supporting to keep the children at home. <clears throat> yeah, and what we're also seeing, which is, uh, which is quite interesting, is that this, this Facebook page um, was created on, on the 6th of April, uh, immediately following um, the prime minister's announcement. Um, but, uh, and there was immediately a, a really high yeah. level of, um, of members, but we're seeing that that level of members is decreasing. So, um, yeah. so I don't think we can, we can sort of securely make that analysis based on the Facebook group, but we can kind of um, hypothesize about, well, the, these parents are experiencing that in the local community, in the local kindergartens, yeah. they're actually doing a good job. So their distrust yes. is being disconfirmed and uh, giving rise to trust. A really nice interaction between the online and the the face to face in, in yes. that kind of way we were talking uh, about. Of course, we don't have the data because uh, the data about who is attending to the kindergartens is something managed locally and not in a national level. But based on the experiences that um, that we have having children in that uh, school age and and other friends and, and colleagues that are in the same situation and that have sent their children they all have noticed a progressive increase on the amount of children that are being sent to school or uh, to daycare. Uh, so we started uh, with parents being hesitant, uh, but progressively has increased in time. And now it has, I mean, we're at the end of May, so it's almost two, a month and a half since uh, daycares and uh, school for small children mm -hmm. opened. But I think definitely the next step in this project would be contacting some of the members yes. of this Facebook group and doing follow-up interviews yes. and, and, and mm. studying their, their timeline. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay.
Yes, uh, there is someone making a comment. Yes, we will send we will send the link. Yeah. Alan. Yeah, I want to pick up on the very last point you made in your presentation, which was about contradiction. And I find this very interesting because contradiction is essentially what inspired uh, my understandings of natural inclusion was that I always had the sense that where you perceive a contradiction, where you perceive an opposition between two sharply opposing views, that necessarily is liable to be, if you look for it hard enough or if you look for it carefully enough, a reconciliation of that contradiction to be found <laughs> through the middle and all around. Essentially, it's that to recognize that there are almost always ways of appreciating that what appear to be opposing views are actually complementary. Uh, and, and it also relates, of course, to the, the structure of our own human brains. Uh, that, uh, you, and so it's, it's this question of, when we look for what for, for, for the complementarity behind the scenes of what on the face of it looks like opposition how do we do that how do we arrive at it and uh, it's sort of related also to your picture of engstroms um, in which you had the subject object divide with a third party in the middle and of course the third party in the middle for me strangely enough from a scientific point of view was space the actual continuity of space everywhere as actually not a barrier between object and subject, but the actual source of continuity, uh, what brings subject and object into uh, mutual relationship. Well, strange enough, the, uh, what's between um, subject and object is in fact the activity. Um, this is um, a Leontiev in the idea of, of understanding conscious human activity um, in, in this way of, of thinking about it's always driving towards a particular object or objective and outcome that's, that's occurring. Um, so that actually does, um, but the, the idea of activity is, is quite precise within activity theory within these um, things. But I wanted to say something about what you started off by saying, um, which I've forgotten completely what I was gonna say. About the contradictions. Oh, contradictions. Okay. Um, the, the idea of contradictions and certainly contradictions in activity theory and subsequently within um, Engelstrom it, it arises from Hegel. Um, so Hegel uh, w was able to, I mean, the great problem that philosophers have is how you can get something new out of old, how, how, how things can change. And so one of the ways that Hegel put that forward is to have thesis, antithesis, um, and then a kind of resolution uh, in that. Um, and he's very precise in the way that he tries to think about that with, while still trying to be very generative. Um, and that's at the basis of the way that we quite often talk about dialogical thinking, where we put one idea against another, but then you combine them in interesting ways to make something new. Um, so yeah, it's a philosophical uh, point of view. It's, um, there are other ways of thinking about how new things can come into being. Um, but it is quite powerful if you start to think about because Hegel was primarily concerned about human social relations. Um, think about it in, in terms of, of the way we interact with each other and the way that we can create new uh, ways of living and ways of working together. Yeah, I mean, uh, what I'd uh, try to put in your mind is the th possibility that there is a way beyond Hegel and there is way, way beyond dialectics. And actually that's what I was talking about to a significant extent. Uh, when, you finally when you finally appreciate that the very idea of contradiction comes around, ultimately it, it's rooted back in Aristotle's law of the excluded middle, which sets up a contradiction before you even begin. Uh, and if you can resolve that contradiction through recognizing uh, that you know, what in Western cultures or Aristotelian based cultures uh, essentially divides matter from space uh, and, and treats them as mutually exclusive. As soon as you understand that they're mutually inclusive, uh, then that changes the way that you, under you can understand uh, the nature of reality and human reality and also the nature of self in relation to neighborhood. 
Um, that's, a, that's an awful lot to say, uh, obviously, but because it's, it's, it's a product of a lot, of, an awful lot of thought and writing, which isn't terribly well known. Um, yeah, I would suggest that the, an activist way of not starting to think about how we think about outside ourselves and how the world interacts with us is far more productive. Um, but, um, and I mean, I have problems with the idea of matter and space being different things as a physicist. Um, and the use of the word energy, even that. But let's actually take some of the things that you were saying and say, if we think about um, a, uh, a natural inclusion or a true perception of, of the reality, how would have the reaction to um, the COVID-19 infection once it started to occur? And we reacted in a very, um, in a, in a very objectivist way. We yeah. took biology very seriously. Um, we took actions which enabled that to do. What would um, a, a non-objectivist, um, a, a true perception, um, the, the natural inclusion way that you're thinking, what would that reaction be to, to, to deal with the COVID-19 crisis? Well, that's, uh, you know, you're asking for an immediate solution. It's, it's more of an approach to understanding the situation that we're in um, and understanding how that arises. And one of the points I was making is that um, if, you under, if you appreciate that uh, partly as a product of, um, of rationalistic thinking, we, we, you know, we, we have overconnected the world in the first place uh, and made, made ourselves wide open uh, to such a possibility of, you know, as, as the virus, which most people have predicted, I would have predicted it long, long ago, uh, that this would sooner or later happen, um, then it's, a, it's, about, it's, it's about moving on to a different perception of yourself in relation to one another and your natural neighbourhood. And, you know, it, when it comes to the actual crisis itself, then all I have to say is, well, yeah, we've got to socially distance. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, very, that's, that's, most, that's very obvious. Uh, that that's that, that that's what needs doing. But what I'm also looking to is how we get beyond this situation, uh, having understood what was behind it all and the ways of thinking that were behind it all. How can we move on in a way that and actually enables us to relate with one another in the natural world in a more uh, in a more favourable way than we currently do. And I just also come in, Ellen, because I think it's very important to bridge this um, uh, dialogue in between uh, natural sciences and social sciences. And one of the things that we often talk about is um, not a non-objectivistic, so that's kind of narrow as well, isn't it? Uh, what we talk about is the second, is, is the middle, that thing in the middle. We talk about the second perspective, to combine the third person perspective looking at with the looking from within so that kind of uh, intuition and sensing fused and married with um, uh, the analytic thought so neither of which would have the solutions or uh, have the deep um, understanding but Ellen also you talk about one and the other and uh, you talk about the philosophical um, kind of um, shift from uh, dualistic perceptions towards something different so it's yeah. not non-objectivistic absolutely not it's something different yeah. yeah thank you and that's that's the issue with dualism i would say yeah hey, to me um i was very interested in your tlmg uh, model and I was, I was very interested in seeing those three levels um, that you used to analyze what was occurring. Because of, I mean, you had so many different models to, 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 to put into your analysis. It was just breathtaking to see such a, a repertoire of, of techniques being brought to bear on, on this problem. So but, um, the, the three levels I actually quite, you know, of activity, sign and values. And I was wondering about the, the, the theoretical derivation of that. I mean, immediately start to think of Peirce, um, Charles Sanford, uh, Sanders Peirce, and his kind of fascination with threes and, and firstness, secondness, and thirdness. But I think it's something different going on there. Where is this idea of, of moving between 
activity sign and um, value come from? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, this is from the Jan Valjuna's idea. He was talking about the purses uh, sign uh, studies, but he differentiated the understanding of sign from the purse and his. He thinking, uh, he says the sign is something that promote a human being to go uh, to the future, something that capture the person and go make it forward to going to the future things. So it's not a just as uh, icons or as, I don't I don't remember the two other names, but uh, the process. So um, how do I say? He, uh, Valsner says that uh, we do the things in activity levels and when we do something, we are having some culture, culturally situated things that capture our mind to do something or not to do something. And he uh, named it as a promoter sign to the thing that to the sign that promote human being to go for to do something and he named the um, prohibited sign to some understanding that captures human being not to do something did that make it sense and on basis yes. of the understanding of the sign of the Jan Balsana uh, Professor Sato and Yasuda made the TMLG uh, models Thank you very much for that. That really does explain some of the, um, the provenance of, of that idea. I had a quick question for you too, Akumi. It's a bit of a, a personal mm -hmm. question. When you said you feel privileged and no fear of unemployment, does that mean um, Japanese universities are having no redundancies or, or that they are and that you've been through that and survived the other end? Well, not actually. Uh because I'm te teaching languages to the foreign student, for me, it's very uh, close to understand what the privilege is like. We are having the California student from the United States and they have the privilege campaign and so on. So but nowadays, uh, some practitioners of the English language they teaching started to promote the uh, privilege campaigns from the United States. So I think it's getting um, perceived by more people. But it was very interesting in the, the ways that you used language, very culturally specific, I suspect, you know, in terms of duties and um, privilege and being blessed, um, you know, stigma, the, the kind of um, very moral uh, way of, of looking at, at the social situation of development mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the universities you're working in. Yeah, thank you. Um, when I talked about the stigma and, stigma and so on things about the COVID-19, people ask me why as you take that as your profession as a language teacher. But in my mind, it's very natural to have it to uh, conclude in my language education because our university have the mission that the language learning a language to communicate with diverse students diverse people in the world so stigma is one of the objection to the uh, wider communication thank you yeah and clearly we're using language here in, in such a powerful way to communicate and connect <laughs> Uh, for very diverse ideas and across a very diverse um, range of uh, places. Well, it looks like no one's going to come in at eight o'clock and say say your time is up, but we've managed to time it beautifully to eight, well, to the two hours. So um, lovely to, to meet you all. Yeah, thank very you very much. I mean, wonderfully diverse group of, of uh, presentations, all absolutely fascinating um, 
and um, I've gained a tremendous amount. Uh, as usual, uh, I gain much more than I ever give out, so I feel a bit guilty. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you to Angel, really. Will you, will you please uh, share the link as well of uh, your presentation, Brendan? And yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that straight away. Thank you. Have a good night for those that are Yes, and uh, have a good day for you as well. You're just starting. <laughs> See you have a good day. I hope it's sunny. <laughs> right. Rarely. I'm, pa I'm pasting that link in now, so there you go. Thank you. Right. Nice. Take, okay. Take, Take care. care. Thank, you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Brendan. That was really, really well done. See you, Eva. Oh. <laughs> we're, the only, we're the only two left, you know. Oh, I'm, Sydney, I'm Sydney and Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> I want, I want, I want, oh, if we if we both go, will all that be left to be the PGC uh, 2020 um, thing? I mean, what will happen? You don't know quite know. They have a <laughs> half an hour gap, and then they will have the second panel. Ah, uh, right. The same, okay. They, they use the same room. Oh, they use so the they same use. space. Okay. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. All right. Have a good okay. evening. Bye. You too.